I am going to share my screen. Let's see, share. And let me know when you can see my screen, folks. We can see it. Someone can just say, great. No worries, no, Jason, we can all see your screen. Awesome. So I'm going to start. Um, I, I do like to keep this sort of in display mode so I can see what's coming up next um, on my slides. But uh, I'm going to go ahead and start. So uh, this is a presentation on crypto art history. Um, I always like to start by telling folks in the residency and really anyone that I talk to that uh, of course, this is going to be from my perspective, and I really encourage folks, you know, to go and explore other perspectives and, and other people's take on crypto art history, because this will be biased based on my experience. But I think one of the advantages is that I have been fairly active um, in the community going back to 2017. Um, so I've, a lot of this isn't just things that I've researched, but, you know, uh, things I've, I've experienced directly. So... Before I jump in, I usually like to, to share a little bit of background because um, I think it's helpful when folks are giving a presentation for you to know who it is that's presenting and a little bit of uh, what their perspective is. My name's Jason Bailey. I'm known as Art Gnome in the space. I've been in crypto art and NFT since late 2017. Um, my background, I, I actually studied uh, studio art, like traditional studio art, so like painting, sculpture, printmaking, and art history in the late 90s. And like a lot of artists, I tried to find work uh, in the art space in the early 2000s, but found that really the, the old art world was a very hard world to kind of make it as an artist um, and ended up going into tech uh, because I couldn't find any way to make a living and kind of abandoned my art practice but always hoped that I'd be able to get back to it. But uh, also spent a lot of time trying to figure out how I could blend sort of this background uh, that I had in technology and art, which ultimately led me to launching a, um, a blog called artgnome.com about five or six years ago. And uh, initially, I was writing a lot about the intersection of art and data. So I had built a very large art history database of complete works by 20th century artists and was kind of nerding out and writing about the, um, you know, different uh, analytics, like a new set of analytics that could be used for analyzing artists in, the, in their output. But a few years into that, I was getting invited to, to events at Sotheby's and Christie's and sort of had made my way into the art world through the back door with all this data that I had. And I was asking a lot of the, the art collectors at these big auction houses and events, how come you never talk about digital art or, or digital artists? And, you know, again, only five or six years ago, it's hard to believe because so many people are really excited about digital art right now. But back then, a lot of what I heard is, oh, that's not real art. You know, like computers can't make real art. And I was like, wow, this is, you know, shocking because... Computing and computers are such a central part of our lives, um, and the idea that that people, you know, weren't receptive to um, artists that were using computing and computers as being real artists kind of, blew, you know, blew my mind. To me, you know, I, I'm sort of fond of saying that. Um, artists that are, are using computers are the most important artists of our generation, you know, and one reason I say that is because if you kind of look back at this generation from 100 years from now, I believe people will ask, well, what was the most important thing that really happened, you know, let's say from like 1960, uh, you know, 2030, and it's really that our lives have been dramatically transformed by computing. So everything we do from how we eat, sleep, drink, you know, et cetera, has been shifted um, by computing. So uh, anyway, I ended up shifting my focus with Art Gnome from sort of the, the historical data analysis and really hyper-focusing on writing about artists like that were using tech um, and computing. So early AI artists, when no one else was really writing about that, and like 2000, uh, you know, 16, 2015, and eventually started writing about blockchain, uh, which is what what brought me around to, to NFTs. 
since I've come into the NFT space, I've tried to, I sort of fell in love with the community and we'll get into that um, in the presentation, but um, have, you know, a few different projects that I've launched. Folks may know me from green NFTs. So in early 2021, when NFT started to take off, there was a lot of backlash. Uh, people in the mainstream press were saying, well, these are really bad for the environment. How can you do these? You know, um, and, you know, there were even some death threats that artists were getting. So we started green NFT to, to try to help address those concerns and to take some ownership within the community of ways to make NFTs more environmentally friendly. Um, and then more recently, in the last two years, I've started a company called Club NFT. So Club NFT is uh, designed for collectors to be able to protect their, their NFTs, and we'll probably get into NFT construction a little bit later. But at a high level, the there's a common misunderstanding that uh, when people create NFTs, that the artwork itself lives on the blockchain, and therefore you don't have to do any work as the collector. But that's very, very um, you know unusual. Typically, the, the art is actually stored on another server and the collectors actually need to back up the the data and the the artwork um, in order to fully custody the work themselves right so that can sound technical and confusing but we have a lot of free information for folks that are trying to figure out how nfts work um, at club nft and all of our solutions are currently free for collectors to back them up and then right click save uh, which is our, our publication um, it's editorially independent from club nft and that comes from the, you know, sort of when NFTs were taking off, so many of my friends in the traditional art world were saying things like, oh, these NFT artists, they're not real artists. Or, you know, I've seen the work, I've gone in the marketplaces, and this isn't real art. And that drove me nuts. And I thought, you know, these are absolutely real artists. And there's like, you know, some amazing work being done here. But I thought maybe what's missing is, you know, a, a publication that actually treats these artists um, and, and this art with the same level of respect that the traditional art world uh, does. So that was sort of right click save. So that's uh, my background. Uh, today, I'll be talking uh, specifically about sort of the history of crypto art with some time at the end to answer questions. And hopefully this context helps you all on your journey. So I like to start at uh, the most basic level and assume that folks may actually not know exactly what NFTs are. It can be a little bit tricky um, and keep it a little bit high level in the definition. So uh, I always start with, you know, what, what actually does the acronym mean? It can be a little bit of a tricky acronym, you know, NFT, particularly uh, the fungible, fungible part. So NFT stands for non-fungible token. And fungible just means that um, something is interchangeable. So the analogy that I use sometimes is that um, if I were to trade a dollar bill with you and ask you to give me a dollar bill back, you wouldn't care. You wouldn't think, oh, my dollar bill is worth more than Jason's dollar bill or my dollar bill is worth less. All dollar bills are sort of interchangeable. So they're fungible. That's what fungible means. Now, non-fungible would be like if I said, hey, you own a Picasso painting. I would like to trade you my niece's crayon drawing for your Picasso painting, right? And you would probably say, no way. My Picasso painting is worth you know, millions of dollars. And while your niece's crayon drawing is cute, it's definitely not worth millions of dollars, right? So that's because art is, is non-fungible, right? So uh, why that matters is uh, in cryptocurrency, you've got Bitcoin and Ethereum. And one Bitcoin is one Bitcoin. My one Bitcoin is worth your one Bitcoin. But when we started creating um, art-based tokens, the, it's not the, the case that every single token um, is, is the same, right? So that's what the non-fungible part means. So why did this matter? You know, what, what, why did NFTs come about and, you know, why did we care about this? Why did we get excited about this back in sort of uh, 2017 when a lot of the crypto art and NFT talk started? It was because for digital artists, a lot of the reason why digital artists felt like they weren't getting collected or they weren't being respected by the traditional art world is because there was a sense, well, digital art should just be free. I can see it on the screen and, you know, uh, anyone can see it on the screen. So it's not really ownable was like this general sense. Like, sure, there are a couple of like pioneering art collectors that would collect digital art on thumb drives or on DVDs and things like that. But it never really felt to most people like you owned it, right? So what we were thinking when we started playing around with NFTs in the early days is maybe we can use the same ideas that prove that there are only so many Bitcoins and, um, you know, these, these ideas that apply to digital scarcity and cryptocurrency and bring them over to digital art so that we can prove that there's actually 
only so many um, you know artworks or that a single artwork is unique and non-fungible and to use the the actual blockchain to be able to track um, the ownership and improve ownership so it was really more of a theory um, in the early days but it's since really caught on um, and, and a lot of people um, you know have become much much more comfortable with the idea of collecting digital art now than they were back in, in the old days um, so some of the benefits we've talked about digital scarcity immutable provenance um, and then smart contract royalties, which we're still working on. But the idea with the smart contract royalties is that with every sale, a portion could go back to the original artist. So I like to, to start all the way back at Bitcoin. So a lot of people that have come in, let's say class of 21, 22, like people that have just started getting into NFTs, don't necessarily have a background in crypto or cryptocurrency, and that's fine. But when you're talking about the history of crypto art, it literally comes from the ideals of, of cryptocurrency and this idea of decentralization. So there was um, the, sort of the, the economic uh, crash of 2007, 2008, when banks were collapsing, and people weren't really trusting um, centralized entities whether it was banks or the government, to act in their best interest. So right around that time, the Bitcoin white paper comes out and Bitcoin is launched. And the idea is that there you don't have to trust any central uh, agency, right? So this, this is a peer-to-peer -peer currency exchange where there's no one person that runs it that you have to, to trust to act in your best interest. Beyond, people are starting to ask, you know, creative folks are thinking like, well, what can we do in terms of, you know, uh, blockchain and, um, and Bitcoin in terms of art? So it starts, you know, because it's, it's very expensive to store files directly on the blockchain, it starts with people that are actually into cryptography, like... Um, uh, this Dan Kaminsky's um, on-chain artwork. It's a tribute to Len Sassaman, who's a, a famous cryptographer who was part of the, of the early cryptocurrency days. Um, and they would hide these things on the actual blockchain itself. So this is 2011, so very, very early. And you know, wouldn't call this, say, an NFT, but maybe more like a proto-NFT. And we get to 2014 and like with a lot of technologies where like it's hard to say that there was any one person who necessarily invented it. Um, you know, it's it's right around the same time a lot of different cre creative folks are playing with um, the blockchain and with ideas that eventually lead to what, what you know, we know today today as uh, NFTs. I think I've got um, some background noise. I don't know if, if folks can mute. I think someone might be uh, washing their dishes. Um, but it's it's really in 2014 where we see start to see this take off. So Kevin McCoy and Anil Dash um, actually demo a program called Monograph.com. Uh, and a lot of folks think of quantum. So this is uh, on the left, this image is uh, Kevin McCoy's quantum as perhaps the, the first NFT. Uh, for me, I'm less about like, I care less about what was the exact first NFT or who was the exact first person. I see it as sort of like multiple people really looking at it from different angles. In that same year, we have uh, Raya Myers, uh, Ethereum, this contract is art. So uh, Ray is coming from more of a conceptual art background and really thinking about the contract itself as being the artwork and exploring uh, that aspect. Billy Lerner, who sadly is often um, overlooked in 2014, um, produces Nilly coins and is asking the question or, or making the statement that money can change your life, but you can change what money is. So you have to remember, even most people back in 2014 are still wondering about the viability of cryptocurrency. But she's putting out um, you know, tokens um, and making the argument that the, the token is the art all the way back in 2014. And what's interesting about Nilly uh, she's sharing these ideas about sort of early proto NFTs with people on the Bitcoin forums, right? And even the Bitcoin folks who are like the people that really understand blockchain back then are saying, oh, this is a scam, you know, like, you know, don't trust her or like we need to kick her off because she was so far ahead of her time. So she's essentially describing what we now know as NFTs, but even the folks that were into cryptocurrencies back then didn't really understand and, and weren't, uh, weren't quite ready for it. Uh, 2015, we have Sarah uh, Mayohas. Um, so she's really one of the first people to, to start thinking about um, 
investing in the artist versus investing in the, the artwork itself, which I think is uh, uh, very prescient for a lot of what we see today. Like, again, we kind of take it for granted now how um, sort of monetized, you know, NFTs are, how like money forward it is and, you know, the idea of markets and buying and selling and sort of the rapid turnover. But pre-NFTs, you know, this is very unusual. In a traditional art market, it would be frowned upon if you bought an artwork and it sold it even within like the next five years you know, it's supposed to be sort of a generational thing where you would buy an artwork and hold on to it and pass it down through the family. And maybe the next generation could consider, could consider selling it. But the idea that you were going to buy and sell art at the, in the same day or, you know, the same week or the same month was sort of absurd uh, before NFTs, right? So it's a really, it's a big shift in the market. And in 2015, um, Sarah Mayojas is sort of, um, you know, exploring this concept of investing in the artists. So if you were to buy um, some of her coins, the Bitcoin, you would actually have um, ownership over future works. But what, what I like to point out is those early pioneers are super important, way ahead of their time, and, you know, should be a part of any history here. But really, they're sort of demoing um, early explorations of the blockchain through their art. And there's not really like an economy there. There's not like hundreds or thousands of people collecting what they've produced. They're really, really early. And they're kind of the ones that are like, you know, first exploring the potential there. But we don't have a whole bunch of uh, NFT collectors. And there's no real sense that that'll ever become like a viable thing until we get to Rare Pepe Wallet in 2016. So Rare Pepe Wallet's created by Joe Looney, and it starts from sort of this meme um, of, of, of a meme economy. So the meme economy is a meme itself, and it's this joke that's going around um, in chat rooms like 4chan and, and other places where people are saying, oh, someday memes will be like a currency and people will want to buy and sell memes. And it's funny because today that's like, yeah, of course people will want to do that. It was actually meant to be absurd when people were talking about it back then and like no one actually thought it would, would ever happen. But increasingly people were like, well, maybe there could be a meme economy. And simultaneously, there were a lot of people making Pepe memes. So Pepe the Frog was a cartoon that got co-opted and became a meme. And people all around the world um, were, were doing variations of, you know, Pepe, including like Katy Perry and other famous people. Uh, eventually, you know, I, I always have to address this point. Eventually, the alt right um, in the U.S. sort of co-opted Pepe, and he became sort of a, a negative symbol associated with Nazis and whatnot. But long before that, there's sort of this community of uh, hyper creative artists that are using Pepe as a way to, to sort of reflect society, right? Which is a, a lot of what art's art's purpose is. And Joe comes along and actually creates. What becomes really, in my opinion, the first NFT marketplace. So uh, it's the blueprint for you know all the modern NFT marketplaces like Super Rare and OpenSea that all come later, and that anyone could come in and contribute artwork, right? So there's some key principles with Rare Pepe uh, Wallet. They intentionally, by design, weren't trying to figure out how to curate, oh, your art is good enough, so you get to participate, or I don't think your art is good enough, so you don't get to participate. They're carrying over these ideals that came from cryptocurrency, that there shouldn't be one centralized authority at the top that decides you know, what's good and what's bad. Instead, let's build a system where everyone can participate, right? So everyone can, can submit uh, Rare Pepe artwork, and you know their only job, they have had a team of people they called the scientists, sort of jokingly, but their only job was to make sure that there wasn't anything that was illegal going up. But they weren't interested in, you know, because they figure art's subjective. Who are we to say what's good art and what isn't good art and who should be able to participate and who shouldn't be able to participate? So for me, this is really where crypto art is born, right? Is is with Rare Pepe Wallet because it's carrying over these principles from cryptocurrency of decentralization, where it's it's asking the question, what if you create a new art world and a new platform where everyone can participate? And if I had to use just a single sentence to describe crypto art from my perspective, it's what happens when you build a system intentionally where everyone can participate, right? So the the other thing to know about Rare Pepe is that 
it scales pretty quickly. At first, people are jokingly saying like, oh, I'll buy this one for, you know, a dollar or two dollars or whatever. And then, you know, because there's only so many of each card, people that wanted the cards, you know, a secondary market evolved. And then like a few people became a few dozen people, became a few hundred people. And it's still active to this day, actually. There, there are thousands of people that actively create and collect um, rare Pepe. So it really is a super important project that gets uh, too often overlooked because it was briefly co-opted co by the alt-right, but we owe a lot of our history um, back to Joe Looney and Rare Pepe Wallet. So 2017, the year after, I think most people associate NFTs with uh, Ethereum. And the first Ethereum-based marketplace is called Curio Cards. So it started by Travis Urig, who um, ran the uh, the Bitcoin meetup in San Francisco for for several years. Um, but prior to this, Ethereum isn't really the the um, you know the the blockchain that people are associating as much with sort of digital collectibles. And we're not even we're not calling these things NFTs for for until you know several years later, right? But Travis uh, similarly is opening up a, a marketplace or a platform where he's making it available to as many artists as want to participate. So again, this idea that we, you know, um, that we need to have heavy curators or that you have to wait in line to get your work, your portfolio approved to become part of a marketplace, all of that comes later. What was actually sort of dramatic and exciting and new about crypto art in the early days is that people really were inviting anyone who wanted to, to participate. Um, and it was making sort of for the first time, large markets. Uh, around people wanting to collect things digitally where maybe they weren't interested before. So also in 2017, um, John and Matt uh, launched CryptoPunks. So they give away 10,000 CryptoPunks with no real idea whether or not anyone is going to be interested in the, in the project. Still pretty early in terms of people that understand uh, cryptocurrency and blockchain. And it starts out a little slow, but people start claiming them uh, rather quickly after a while. And again, as with Rare Pepe, uh, people wanted ones that other people had claimed. So so uh, uh, organic market sort of developed. And for the better part of a year, you know, people are spending like, you know, 10, 15, 20 dollars. I think end of 2017, I bought my crypto punks for like maybe 80 dollars, 100 dollars or something like that. And while we we're all having fun, I don't think any of us predicted that they'd eventually, you know, some of them would sell for millions of dollars. That comes a little bit later on. But I think this is a really critical project because um, it was so sort of so easy for people to identify with like cryptocurrency can feel sort of alienating and confusing and blockchain has all these fancy tech tech terms that confuse folks but pretty much anyone could look at crypto punks and like think like oh I want to find one that looks like me or this one looks like a famous person they were just really unassuming um, you know uh, in terms of uh, being really accessible although I do I like to point out that you know I think of them sometimes people are like well are CryptoPunks collectibles or are they art? And for me, I actually do lean towards thinking of them um, as a generative art project. So they didn't go in and draw all of these, you know, by hand, um, you know, one after the other. They wrote code that combined these different features together for all 10,000, right? So this sort of recombinant approach to um, generating images is actually fairly classic um, within the, the generative art space. And um, they... The, well, they often sort of, again, get sort of thought of as commercial or maybe more collectible oriented. Uh, I think it's important to remember that they become sort of the prototype or the blueprint for um, PFP NFTs, right, which become a pretty major thing years on. Sometimes people look at these and they're like, ah, it's just a PFP project. But you have to remember there were there was no such thing as like a PFP NFT project before CryptoPunk. So this is like wholly original, right, and, and really important, I think, to crypto art history. So then also in 2017, we have Dada NYC. And again, you'll see this, this trend of like everyone gets to participate. So first with, you know, um, the Rare Pepe, everyone can submit art. Then with uh, Curio Cards, all artists were welcome. Then with the CryptoPunks, everyone can come and take these things for free, right? And now with Dada NYC, this was a global drawing platform where people from all around the world could communicate with each other by creating drawings and then someone would extend their drawings. So to get around the language barriers, everybody could um, communicate, you know, visually. And it was this beautiful 
beautiful project that had hundreds of thousands of drawings. And uh, Bea, who uh, co-founded it with um, Judy Mam, was a, uh, was at an early Ethereum conference and thought, well, maybe there's an opportunity here to build an entirely new economy, right? So the old art world economy, where you have a very small amount of artists that are making lots and lots of money and a very small amount of collectors, you know, who are all millionaires, that economy felt broken for so many artists in the world. And this was a message that really resonated with me as, as sort of a failed artist. What if we built a new economy where you know uh, we could use uh, the, the blockchain and have sort of a token system where if anyone sells anything, the work could be redistributed across all of the artists, and rather than take giant commissions like you know uh, traditional art galleries take up to 50%, what if we took um, almost no commission and it all went to the artist or any commission we took was redistributed to the platform? So these early sort of radical experimental ideas um, are, are are really the DNA of what crypto art is. Like, hopefully you can sort of see a thread that's running through where, you know, people are, are using this technology not to figure out how to make, make a bunch of money in the early days by any means. They're experimenting with it in sort of this idealistic way to figure out, can we build a new art world? Literally, that was the goal that um, can support more people and can be more fair um, towards artists. And then also late 2017, sort of the first, what I would call the first commercial um, NFT platform, Rare Art Labs, uh, is launched. So this is more from a commercial perspective. This is like the predecessor to uh, Super Rare and um, and Known Origin and, you know, the, the more... Um, you know, the companies essentially that took uh, funding, you know, from uh, investors and really from the get go, their goal was less about let's make a community driven thing that kind of functions on its own and more let's find a way to not to say that they didn't have um, good intentions, uh, but that they're definitely functioning more as a company and less as a community experiment. Right. So Rare Art Labs is sort of the first of, of those. So this is around the time that I come in um, to the crypto art space. Late 2017, uh, a friend of mine that uh, I had been talking to about AI and AI art was like, hey, you should check out the blockchain. Um, it addresses a lot of things you're interested in. With your art database, it could help you figure out how to have a better distributed and more permanent provenance that people can't tamper with. Your interest in digital art, you know, this idea of digital scarcity that comes from um, from Bitcoin. People are exper experimenting with bringing that over to digital art. And um, this idea of automated royalties could really be a, a more fair way for artists to participate in their own market moving forward. So I wrote this article called the uh, Ambition called The Blockchain Art Market is Here after doing about two or three hours of research um, on the blockchain because um, my, my friend Ahmed was right. I was like, wow, like, you know, this really could be um, a big shift. So this article, because I had good SEO on my, my um, website, artgnome.com, I woke up the next day and I literally had hundreds and hundreds of invitations to like speak like around the world and travel and weigh in. And it was because in late 2017, Cryptocurrencies were actually going through the roof, like the market was really, really hot. So people were looking up, you know, everything and anything that had to do with cryptocurrency, including like cryptocurrency and art. And my article was like the, the primary article that came up. So the four things that I sort of outlined in that first article are that the, the benefits are that it could drive digital art sales through digital scarcity. It could democratize fine art investment. So th that's the idea that you could sort of break up um, a single artwork into many different individual tokens, almost like stocks that people could invest in. It could improve provenance and reduce art forgery, and it could create a more ethical way of paying artists. So this article um, ended up being sort of the entry point to almost all of the early artists in the space. There just weren't a lot of other people writing about this at the time. Um, so uh, a lot of marketplaces were built based on this article and a lot of uh, the artists that came into the space, um, you know, first read this article. And for, I'd say, the better part of the, you know, the next two or three years, if you looked up anything to do with crypto art or NFTs, this was kind of the first thing that came up. So I thought, well, I better actually learn um, more about blockchain chain in this community, you know, if, if I'm going to have all these invitations and all these questions coming in from my from my article. And I was lucky that just the month after I wrote that article, 
the uh, Rare AF One. So this is the conference that generally people, uh, a lot of people would argue, this is like where crypto art is born as a community, right? So until this point, these projects that I've been talking to you about, Rare Pepe and Dada NYC and Crypto Punks, like these were all done by separate communities that didn't necessarily interact. Some of them were sort of aware of each other, but they're really sort of nerdy, small communities that are doing like one-off projects. But at Rare AF, AF, everyone comes together in New York City from all the different experimental groups that are working, you know, artist groups that are working on different chains and have different ideas. And we realize, you know, people thought, well, maybe it'll just be like a small meetup. But there's like standing room only um, at the event. And we realize like, holy crap, this is a movement, right? We're building a new art world here. And while we don't all have the exact same ideas about what it is we're building, um, you know, we have a lot of respect for each other. And we're going to sort of unify here and work together together to build an art world that's that's more fair for artists right or at least aspires to that um and, and is more welcoming um and open to collectors so really idealistic in the best possible way in the early days um and you know we hadn't really hit the speculative points yet so um after that i was inspired at that conference to write sort of a charter called what is crypto art to my understanding this is sort of the the very first like the ten commandments the very first attempt attempt to sort of seriously define crypto art as a movement. Um, and this was another article that uh, became sort of an entry point for a lot of people. So uh, I won't go through and read the whole thing. Uh, you can always find it online. But basically, like the, the tenets were that, you know, crypto art is digitally native geographically agnostic, meaning you could come from anywhere in the world and participate. It's democratic and permissionless. Again, re remember at the time, there's no curation. Anyone can join. And I still think that should be a core uh, tenet of crypto art. Decentralized, right? So you don't have to get permission from some authority, um, you know, at, at a gallery. Um, Anonymous, so people could come in and didn't have to necessarily share their identity, which becomes important if your art is going against your government and you come from a country where that's, you know, not allowed. Emetic, so, you know, a lot of crypto art is inspired by memes um, and, and, and brings in memes, often memes from, from cryptocurrency. Um, Self-referential, so a lot of times the, the early crypto art would reference things like the Bitcoin pizza and things like that. So there's a point where Crypto art is also sort of serving as um, a gateway to help bring new folks in to, to understand, you know, cryptocurrency, right? So it's a way to illustrate some of that history. Crypto patrons. So uh, a lot of the people that were buying early crypto art had made a, a crap load of money uh, on the uh, sort of bull run in cryptocurrency, and they weren't traditional art collectors. It's a whole new breed of collectors that were found themselves to be sort of newly rich and were interested in sort of investing in a, a culture and an art that reflect, uh, reflected their community. Pro artist, so this idea that uh, we wouldn't take commissions, which of course has changed since then, but early crypto art days, uh, Rare Pepe Wallet took zero commission for any sales, um, and there was this idea that you know we could build a decentralized system um, that was more fair for artists. And Dankness was sort of the last one I listed, and the idea here is that if you're gonna, and this is important, if you're gonna build a movement like crypto art where you're saying everyone can participate, you can no longer judge art by old standards where you're just going to say, oh, well, this one's the best because this person is like has the most years experience in college and can draw really realistically or understands art history really well. And like these things that you would expect in the traditional art world kind of move to the side and it becomes more about expressivity. So it's not about like who's been drawing the longest or painting the longest or who can code the best, really to validate everybody participating. It's more about being measuring this art by like how expressive it is, which is something that anybody can be, can be expressive regardless of background or skill. Um, so following that article, I wrote an article called Blockchain Artists Wanted. And again, this is just to give folks a sense of where we were back in 2018. You know how we have lines and lines of people, for example, that want to get of artists that want to get on Super Rare today, and like you see it on Twitter all the time, like oh, I didn't get accepted to this or I didn't get accepted to that. It was so hard to get um, artists to, to to join these platforms back then that I was writing articles like telling artists like, hey, I just made this random GIF and made like eight hundred dollars in one week, and like 
you don't need permission. You can just hop on to any of these platforms and like start selling your work. And like, there's like, a, there are essentially more buyers than there were artists in, in early uh, 2018. So I'm like writing articles like blockchain artists wanted, right? And like, you know, the, the platforms were begging me like, hey, can you find some artists that like, you know, that we can put onto our platform? So to show you like an example of that, again, Super Rare today has like these long waiting lists of people trying to get on. They were actually thinking about paying artists to come on when they first started. They don't come from the art world. And when they first launched, uh, pe the, most people didn't even know what the heck a, a, an NFT was or what the blockchain was. So, you know, they were first they were thinking, well, maybe we should see if we can pay some artists because they had no artists. And then they asked me, you know, could you introduce us to some artists? So the first three or four artists on Super Rare were actually people that I made introductions to Super Rare for. And uh, the very first one was an artist named Robbie Barrett. Um, so I, as a collector, had the problem of, of wanting to collect Robbie's work. He's an early AI artist, and I was like fascinated by his work and really wanted to collect it. But again, like there weren't great ways back then to collect digital art. So when Super Rare came along, I thought, perfect, you know, can I be your first collector? I'll bring Robbie as an artist to you and collect this work. So we built a, a pretty good relationship and actually uh, built out these cards because, again, no one knows really back then that the number of collectors are in like the dozens. Like most people, it's not a big thing back in 2018. And we're all trying to figure out how to make this space bigger. So I was invited to speak in London at Christie's in front of a bunch of traditional art world people at a blockchain conference. And it's important to know back then when the art world was talking about blockchain, they had no interest in digital art. They were trying to figure out, can we use the blockchain as like a database to track paintings and sculptures and things like that? So Super Rare and Robbie and I um, teamed up and during my presentation at Christie's to the traditional art world, um, I explained to them that I was giving out an NFT to every single person at the conference. So they were on these cards and you could scratch the back off and it would give you the number to claim your NFT. And I swear, like everyone was looking at me yawning, like, you know, falling asleep and like kind of wondering, like, who let these guys on the panel that are like talking about digital art, like no one collects digital art and like, you know, what are these NFT things? But I beg them, don't throw away these NFTs. They're going to be worth something someday. Like I'll even buy them back from you if you don't want them. Um, but it turned out two or three years later, all but 25 of the 300 NFTs, uh, all but 25 of those cards were pretty much thrown away. And when NFTs became very popular, each one of those cards started to sell for up to like six or seven hundred thousand dollars, right? So this became sort of a big uh, part of the mythology of crypto art and NFTs. They call it the Lost Robbies because this was sort of the first attempt to tell the traditional art world, hey, this is where the world's going. Like digital art is the future, and this is the way to collect it. And like AI art is like legit, and they kind of just you know turned their backs on it, and threw it away, completely ignored us. Uh, but there were they were open and interested in the like I said in the idea of blockchain as a way to track traditional art. Um, so there were some inroads made on that front. So I'm going to pick up the pace a little bit to catch us up to, to where we are today. But hopefully you can see in the early days it was really altruistic, um, although we did start to see some interest in collecting in 2018. But by 2019, the second rare art festival, it went from standing room only with like, you know, hundreds of people and feeling like we were building an entirely new movement to just being like back down to like a couple dozen people, right? Like it was way smaller in, tw in 2019. And that's because the cryptocurrency market had crashed. Um, and there's absolutely, you know, uh, a correlation between interest in, in NFTs and cryptocurrency. We're currently in a bear market. So, you know, not as many people are buying and selling NFTs right now, and it's partially because we're coming off of several months, right, where cryptocurrency um, has, has been crashing. And it was like that in 2019, and we were asking each other, are NFTs even going to be a thing? Like, the big question in 2019 was like, you know, can we get enough collectors to even support the number of artists that are in now? Because all these people that made money with crypto don't seem to be around, and like, you know, it was really just the diehards that were, that were there. 
2020, so the year after, we did get those collectors in that year, 2019. We all worked together, and there were a few whales, they call them. So, like, really big early collectors like Basilius and Mata Rats and Whale Shark. Um, you know, you could count them less than a dozen collectors that were uh, coming in and, and supporting a large number of these artists and were really important. Uh, but then by 2020, the question was, okay, okay, okay. So great, you've got a dozen big collectors that are coming in and supporting, you know, some artists, but like that's not really a market. You guys don't really have a market until you have secondary sales, right? So the question at Rare AF 2020 was like, can we scale this up to a point where like, you know, people will actually buy um, not just the initial sale straight from the artist, but is there a secondary market we can build where collectors will start to buy from each other? And that kind of evolves around 2020. And then all hell breaks loose. Um, in 2021, Christie sells the Beeple work for $70 million. That makes it on the news, like all around the world. And instead of it just being, you know, again, like a, a, a hundred or less like nerds buying and selling, you know, digital art, which is pretty much what it was up until that point. Now everyone is fascinated because they're like, how could a, a digital image sell for $70 million? And all the speculators come in because they want to get in. They feel like it's early and they don't necessarily even care about art. They just want to buy work because they think maybe this will go up for, you know, millions of dollars too, right? And the entire market shifts. It grows from, a you know, 100 or less people to like thousands and thousands of people and artists come flocking in and, you know, we see... Um, you know, Saturday Night Live is is doing rap songs about like what's an NFT, and you know that's right around the time the environmental concerns come out. So, an artist, uh, Memo Aitken, wrote a uh, sort of a, an article that looked a lot deeper at what the the carbon footprint was of NFTs. And up until that point, as we've talked about, we were really sort of altruistic, positive artists that like thought this was going to be a better system. We didn't really realize, um, you know, the the electrical um, consumption and power consumption associated with NFTs. So um, it looked pretty bad when the the, the um, environmental stuff came out, and a lot of us thought this might be enough to kind of shut down our whole movement. And none of us were against the environment. Most of us are like very pro environment. But it got to a point where people were just kind of beating each other up, and we weren't making any progress, right? And artists were literally literally getting death threats. So I, I put out a simple tweet that just asked, "Hey, if I, you know," put some money, um, you know, donated some money and some time, would other people from the NFT community participate um, and build out sort of a, a green NFTs initiative so that we could build like a hackathon and at least like try to think through, like, sure, we may not be able to solve the whole problem, but like, let's take some ownership over this and get the environmentalists that are angry to join and participate towards a solution and get the artists who are getting, you know, being given a hard time, even though maybe their footprint may be really small outside of NFTs. You know, a lot of artists, you know, that maybe, you know, didn't have a lot of money and never traveled much or didn't even own a car and had an otherwise small footprint, but now we're able to feed their family during, you know, the, the pandemic with their art, we're getting, you know, beat up. So like, let's find a way to bring everyone together. And it resulted in a great hackathon with a bunch of cool solutions. Um, and we continue to sort of fund pro environmental NFT projects today. So sort of an important part um, of, of the history for folks that have lived through it. You, they definitely remember. Um, that was a really challenging time. And out of that came Hick at Nunk. So uh, Tezos was a much friendlier, environmentally friendly um, uh, blockchain. And Hick at Nunk was a platform um, that launched on Tezos. And for a lot of artists that saw that the markets were growing and artists, digital artists were starting to make a lot of money and getting a lot of recognition, but they didn't want to participate on Ethereum at the time because it was you know, still proof of work. I don't know that I'll get into proof of work versus proof of stake, but just know that Ethereum used to be uh, much less efficient for the environment and it's now much more efficient. But at the time, um, the Hick at Nunk marketplace offered this alternative. So a lot of great digital artists, particularly generative artists, that maybe weren't that interested when it was just about cryptocurrency and whatnot, but then saw that like this was becoming a real market and saw that they could do this in an environmentally friendly way, all came in through Hick at Nunk um, in... I guess this is 2022, um, or I, we might still be in 2021. I should have the number on the slide. Um, 
So then we also start to see, and you'll see this even today, um, you know, pretty much every other month through 2021 and into 2022, you would see the press like writing articles that like the bubble has popped, NFTs are going away, crypto art is dead, right? And then the very next month you would see like record sales, right? So I include this just to say that like, the press kind of has like a love hate relationship with NFTs and like, you know, I, I encourage you like not to worry too much about what people are writing because very often they, they get it wrong. Um, a couple other big trends that we saw in those years, and then I'll, I'll move on to, uh, to questions and kind of scoot through the rest of these slides. So generative art actually wasn't something that was like a, a big and critical part to crypto art in the early days. Most crypto art in the early days was made by folks that were really into cryptocurrency and they're kind of skewed towards like sci-fi and 3D art and vaporwave and stuff like that. So it's not until we sort of see initially through Hick at Nunk, you know, we see some of the uh, generative artists come in and then with art blocks, um, generative ar artists are coming in and generative art even as a thing wasn't really a big big thing like there were or like a small number of collectors around the world that were really into it you know it was something i've been into for the last 20 years and had written about but like wasn't a huge thing until nfts so art blocks kind of helps put generative art on the map and that becomes a really big trend where everybody wants to collect generative art and we see it kind of move on to other platforms like uh, fx hash and then the other big trend that we saw was sort of PFP mania, right? So um, all of a sudden, every project had to be like 10,000 variations on uh, some sort of cartoon theme. And like, you know, it became, we our, our NFT space became so flooded with PFPs that they became, you know, most of them became essentially like worthless, right? Because it was just done like over and over and over again. But these two are sort of interesting genres that emerge, I think, directly as a result um, of NFTs. So yeah, this is sort of a silly non-scientific graph that I drew um, that becomes periodically useful because there's a lot of volatility in the space because uh, NFTs and crypto art are tied to cryptocurrency, which is inherently a volatile uh, currency, right? But the thing to know is that like all the coolest projects and like the best time to be in the space is actually uh, when things are kind of quiet, when the market's down, right? So things like Rare Pepe and, you know, in CryptoPunks, that was people that like, you know, traded cryptocurrency or were interested in decentralization that were bored because the markets were down, right? And again, a lot of these marketplaces launched, I was talking about how, you know, 2018, 2019 were really quiet years, right? And they struggled when they launched, but, you know, that's when a lot of the cool stuff gets, um, gets released, right? So, and the idea is that the speculators will come running in and then running out when the money goes away and then running in and running out when the money goes away. But the core community, the creative people that are actually here trying to build sort of a new supportive uh, art world does slowly grow with each wave that, that comes in. So just a couple, of, I know, you know, this is um, an artist residency. Um, so I'll get into a couple of slides that sort of talk about advice around, um, you know, how I think artists should engage into this space. Um, first, you know, why do I think NFTs will be around um, for a long time? And wh why aren't they just like a random short fad? I think this tweet uh, from a while back captures it pretty well. You know, our generation's culture is largely digital. NFTs let us preserve and collect that history the way previous generations did with analog history. It sometimes looks clunky because the solutions aren't perfect and we are in transitional period, but the train has left the station. So what I mean by that is our lives are entirely digital, right? And like our, our art and our writing and our culture is so like digital oriented and we need a way to make it sort of preservable and like, you know, a way that we can act as stewards because we're we're already seeing a lot of the culture from like the 1990s internet culture is already starting to disappear, right? So where we have like, you know, uh, buildings from Greece from hundreds and hundreds of years ago, we're already losing core components of our own culture from just 10, 15 years ago. So NFTs more than just being about buying and selling, we really need to be thoughtful about how, how are we going to preserve our generation's culture. And my advice to folks that are coming into the space, because a lot of artists are like, ooh, I want to make NFTs because I want to make a bunch of money. I'm going to come in and try to sell and like it almost never works for them. Like rather than come in and immediately trying to figure out how can I extract value 
um, from this community by getting money from people, I sort of do my crypto version of John F. Kennedy, which is like, ask not what crypto art can do for you, but what you can do for crypto art. So come in, join a community, you know, compliment some artists, you know, hop on some Twitter spaces, do some writing or like find a way to, to, to give to the community before you come in and immediately are trying to wonder like why people aren't buying your work and giving to you. Right. Um, and that's how we can cumulatively build this into a space that people actually want to be in that can grow over time. The other advice is patience and humility. So a lot of people, a lot of artists, I should say, come in and they're like, holy smokes, X copy selling works for like millions of dollars. Like I want to sell work for millions of dollars. But I remind people that like I bought X copies first NFT like three or four years ago for one dollar. Um, and his work sold for like a dollar, you know, for, for a long time. Um, you know, several years later, um, I was buying X copies for $5, right? So he didn't come into the space and think, I'm going to make millions of dollars. No one was making millions of dollars. None of these artists that the OGs and the crypto art and NFT space came in to make money. They came in to be part of this new community to try to experiment with a new system to see if we could build, you know, uh, more equitable systems and to get to know each other and like, you know, to, to really experiment, right? And because they came in early, some of them did really well, but they had to be really patient. So, you know, be patient and, and you know, uh, don't worry if it takes a little while. Sarah Zucker is another artist that I like to mention. She had amazing work sitting on Super Rare that was just sitting there unsold for the better part of a year. And it wasn't until I was actually able to make my first sale as a collector that I went and bought a bunch of them and then other people started coming in. And now she's doing incredibly well, right? Has her work in museums and sells really well. But, you know, these were folks that, you know, came in and were, were very patient, were contributing a lot to the community before any of this stuff actually ever happened for them. Um, other advice, uh, hard work and abundance. So sometimes you'll hear collectors, you know, not as much these days, but in 2021, when the, the market got really, really hot, there were a lot of really rich collectors that had no understanding of art or background in art, and they were pressuring artists to actually make less work. So they were saying, well, I just bought this work off of you for $100 or $1,000 or $10,000, and now you're making too much work and you're flooding your, your market. My advice to artists is just completely ignore those collectors and avoid them as much as you can. Make as, you know, you know what you need to be doing in terms of making, you know, your work. Like, make as much work as you can. That's how you get better. That's how we all get better at anything. And, like, ignore any of the, the gallerists, marketplace people, or collectors that are, like, trying to manage your output as an artist. It's not worth it, um, you know. And it's the history shows that artists that create an abundance of, uh, of work actually do really well. So Warhol and uh, Van Gogh and Picasso were some of the most productive artists out there. There, um, and they almost always lead in total sales year over year in the traditional art market. So uh, the idea that you have to somehow artificially restrict your output is, is nonsense. And then, yeah, just a reminder, you know, you've gotten my version of crypto art history today um, as I lived it and as I understand it. But go and talk to other people and, you know, get different perspectives. Uh, Martin Lucas Ostachowski has an amazing uh, timeline of crypto art that you can go and check out on his website. And, you know, he'll have a different take than I will. And people that are more into the collectibles, you know, would criticize my approach and say, oh, you didn't talk about like all these early collectibles. So it's sort of, you know, no the history um, and getting involved is sort of an ongoing process, but hopefully um, my, uh, my you know, general background gave you a little bit of a foundation to start with. So yeah, I know that's a, a lot. I probably went the better part of an, an hour there, uh, but I uh, want to make sure that I leave some time for questions. Let me unshare my screen. Let's see. Do, do, do. Stop streaming. And then just take a real quick look to see what I have for time. Uh, one second. Boo -doo -boo -boo. Check my other calendar. Come on, calendar. Who's this? But in the meantime, um, if folks have questions, um, I'm definitely open to uh, certainly taking at least a few questions and encourage you not to be shy. Hello, Jason. Uh, this is uh, Christian Book. I'm a poet and a member of the Versaverse. I'm curious to know what you foresee as being an, a trend that might occur that you haven't mentioned so far. Is there something on the horizon that you would foresee occurring in the world of NFTs that might interest you as both a collector and an art historian? 
Uh, I'm curious to know what you think the future might entail for the rest of us. Yeah, I do think um, there there are a few trends that I've I've thought about. Um, one generally with NFTs, I believe that the, the NFTs are swinging up and down, but generally I believe that digital ownership is a trend that's not going to go away, right? NFTs are fairly new, but digital ownership goes back um, decades. So I think about how I used to have VHS cassettes or DVDs, right? And now um, all my music and my movies and all these things are digital. So I think we're going to see an increase in participation in collecting of digital art. It'll be less controversial, right? And NFTs actually had a fair amount of controversy uh, versus associated with them over the last few years. And while that's kept them in the news cycle, which has kind of helped to grow it, it hasn't always been healthy. And what I'm seeing now trend-wise is that it's, it's less about, you know, the format of the NFT and people caring more about digital art. So we're seeing museums who were kind of like the, the old art world, the museum type folks, we're pretty skeptical of NFTs for a while. And this year, we're starting to see an increasing number of, of museums sort of embrace NFTs, right? Um, so that's one trend. Another trend that I think we'll see is uh, in order for more and more people to be able to collect, I think prices will go down and additions will become more common. Additions will go up, right? So if we really want a new art world that supports a larger number of artists and a larger number of collectors, most people aren't millionaires, right? Um, and can't afford to spend millions of dollars for each artwork. So I think we'll see things where, um, you know, one way that artists can continue to get paid, uh, but make their work affordable to a larger group of collectors that are maybe collecting more frequently and spending less would be to drive up the number of additions, right? So I think we'll see um, the uh, addition number go up over time. And another one that might be a little controversial, but what the hell, I'll throw it out there. Um, I think we're going to see a backlash against, I mean, I love generative art and AI art. I was one of the first people to really write in a popular way about it three or four years ago um, and have you know been into generative art for better part of 20 years. But we've seen so much of it in the last year or two years that we've sort of been flooded by it. Like everyone's become a, a digital artist or a, sorry, I should say a generative artist or an AI artist. And I think we're going to see a swing the other direction to where people want to collect things that feel like they were like digitally done by hand if that makes sense. So almost think about like early 20th century expressionism, where it was less about accuracy, like as a revolt to like the camera and photography, art like went more into like, you know, the, the things that are uniquely human and expressive that could only be done sort of by hand and less about capturing things that are accurate. It's a, it's a variant of that, but I think we will see sort of what I would call like a digital expressionism um, and a, a more manual approach as uh, a revolt to the more automated sort of work that uh, is awesome and that I love, but that we're seeing in, in such large doses, usually you see the sort of the pendulum swing in art history. So yeah, hopefully that's a, a helpful. Um, Jason, that result. last point I think is a really amazing and insightful thing to say. I know Una and Cesar have uh, questions to ask. Awesome. Yeah. I think maybe is, Una, it looks like Una was up first. Hey, yeah, thank you. And great question, Christian, as Asian. Um, one thing that kind of stood out to me in all of the kind of this um, financial price tag or the denied attention. And do you think that art will ever, um, the price tags aren't so related to the? What stood out to me and what you said is that, like, what things have got the R's, the the Beeble Christie's, the even even the app being worth that much more, or the lost ones being worth that way, it's seen as um, worthy without price tag. Yeah, no, that's a great question. So what I what I like to point out. Because when NFTs first started getting frothy and like it became about the money and like how much things were selling for, a lot of my friends from the traditional art world were like, this art's just about money. And I had to laugh, right? Because the, the traditional art world is so just about money. Like if you look at what makes the news, you know, in the traditional art world, like the news that the regular public see, it's like Salvatore Mundi sells for $250 million. This, you know, rich couple got a divorce and are fighting over which paint, who gets to keep the paintings, you know, so-and-so backs up into a sculpture and knocks it over and it breaks out a gallery. And, you know, it was worth X dollars, right? So this sort of financial, financialization of art um, happened long, 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 
long before NFTs came around, um, you know, uh, would be my first point. So sadly, I don't think the financialization of art is going to go away. It's just too baked into the DNA. Um, but uh, to, to more directly answer your question, as someone who cares a lot about art and art history and was, an, you know, consider myself an artist, uh, an artist myself, I take is that the relationship between prices and um, how interesting or good the art is, um, you know, th that I've seen over the last four years, th that there almost is zero relationship. I see like art that is like not interesting at all to me, and I know it's you know can be subjective, but like art that you know that I don't think has any real historical merit or interesting at all, sell for insane prices, millions of dollars. I personally collect, um, you know, on Tezos regularly, almost daily. I'm buying works for like five dollars, ten dollars, or whatever that I think are are phenomenal, right? Um, so, like, you know, I, I don't know that we can break that. I think that's just the way, like, the mainstream media and, and like, you know, sort of the super rich people want to like be able to turn artists into art stars and like that will always be there but like what i hope is that we can build an alternative world or an alternative market where lots and lots and lots of collectors aren't intimidated it's not like you go into the the gallery where you feel like you're being stared down or you have to have the right amount of money or whatever like you can pop online find art that you love it doesn't have to be something that everyone else has collected it's just something that you like the risk is super low like 100 bucks or less you know that you're spending all the way down to as much as 5 10 50 bucks hopefully for those artists they can addition that work up enough so that it's still like meaningful sales for them because we don't want to undercut the artists when i say low prices are good it's not that i don't want the artists to make money but artists if your work costs like shit loads of money the only people you're going to attract are like super wealthy people right and we want to expand not only the number of artists that can participate but the number of people that can collect right that feels like a healthier direction so yeah i don't see any correlation between price and quality of art and this space um, but to me that's fine that means i get to collect awesome art for for you know very affordable prices like i wouldn't have it any other way like it's very easy to ignore dumb people spending crazy amounts of money on things that you're not interested in uh, great question Anna. cheers <laughs> cheers thank you so much yep uh let's go to caesar uh, thank you so much for the presentation. It was really informative and thorough. Uh, at some point, you were talking about the NFTs as kind of mechanisms for preserving digital culture, which which makes a lot of sense. And maybe this question ties into your work with Club NFT as well a little bit. But I've learned at some point in my NFT journey that oftentimes the artwork is not actually stored on the blockchain; it's stored something else, somewhere else, right? Like on a different infrastructure that still needs some sort of maintenance and keep, uh, yeah, just like keeping costs over uh, over the course of time. So I was curious, yeah, what your thoughts are around how people can uh, kind of, yeah, store NFTs safely and like how those infrastructures can get to live for as long as the blockchain lives and for as long as the actual NFT lives. Yeah, it's a, it's a fantastic question. So I learned the hard way as a collector, a lot of the NFTs I collected in 2017 and 18, when marketplaces shut down um, in 2018, more than half of the marketplaces went out of business in 2018 uh, into early 2019 because the market was down. Almost all of my NFTs broke or disappeared, right? So all these like talks that we were giving about like, and it's forever, right? Like I learned the hard way that 90% of the time, the artwork itself, the thing that we all care about, isn't on the blockchain. The blockchain is good at a lot of things, but it's insanely expensive to store even small image files on the blockchain. So it almost never happens unless someone's doing like a really clever trick. So the thing to look for to answer your question, we have another amazing technology. It doesn't have as big a fan base. Everyone goes crazy and gaga for blockchain and, you know, and for um, crypto. But IPFS to me is just as important to NFTs as the blockchain in terms of technology. So IPFS interplanetary file system uh, created initially by protocol labs what it does for you as an artist right is it guarantees that when you make your token if you store your art on uh, your pin your art using ipfs it guarantees that to the collector that art will never change so i'm going to give a simple example but if you're a photographer and your nft is a photo of a sailboat 
um, it makes a hash based on the actual bits and bytes of that the digital image, right? And, and links it permanently to the token. So if anyone ever changes that sailboat or tries to, to like a picture of like a dog turd or something that you didn't want, uh, it's impossible with IPFS. So you get this persistence, right, of the art, which is great. But then another magical property about IPFS is that as long as the collector downloads all the files that you uploaded, so the metadata and the, and the artwork to IPFS, as long as your all your collectors download and back up those files locally, they don't have to worry ever because if it if it's no longer pinned on IPFS because the marketplace you worked with went out of business, the collector themselves can actually restore it, right? So and it's because there's that hash or that link that's created based on the content. So that's where Club NFT comes in, my company. A lot of collectors don't know how to download all the files in the format they need them in or to restore them. So you can go, you just go to Club NFT for free, put in your wallet, we'll give you all the files you need. And and send them to you. But yeah, it's really IPFS is the technology that um, in terms of permanence where people can't change the image, A, and lots of people can download local copies of it and restore it, B, and multiple people could pin it, uh, C. So that's really the solution. Like if I were going to push you in a direction as artists to like, what should I do to make sure that my NFTs are permanent? You can ask the marketplaces that you're talking to, like, are you using IPFS? You know, and you can you can kind of figure that out. A lot of times, real quick, people will say, well, what about Arweave, right? Because they hear like, Arweave is like permanent storage and Manifold uses Arweave. And I love Manifold, but I really want them to switch to IPFS because I mean, Arweave is Arweave. It's a company. That's great. If you believe Arweave as a company and Arweave as a, a currency is going to last forever, then great. Like, I guess use Arweave, you know, but I don't want to have to add that level of complexity to making sure my NFTs don't disappear. Like, why throw in yet another company with an experimental currency associated with it and have that all have to succeed in order for my NFT not to break when I could just use IPFS? So yeah, that, hopefully that's a, um, I want to make sure I, I give time for the other questions, but hopefully that at least gives you a, a spot to start. Um, let's see. Yeah, thank you. S yeah, thank you for the question. Sapadron Art, uh, can we have the presentation to analyze in more detail? Yeah, I think they, um, I think they've recorded and shared this presentation in the past, but I'm happy to share the, uh, the cleaned up version of the slides as well. But I think Borea has definitely um, shared shared this presentation in the past. Uh, let's see, uh, Java Loyas. Uh, probably getting the name wrong, but uh, e e e <laughs> sorry, what is it? Alex, that's fine. That's good. Oh. Yeah, got it. Hey, Alex. So I'm Alex. I'm a visual artist, a digital artist from Spain, now living in France. First of all, thank you for the presentation. It was super interesting. And then going back to the pioneering article that you wrote uh, on what's crypto art, uh, it struck to me that one of the essential points was decentralization. And we've seen lately an exponential increase in terms of gatekeeping and, and power verticality. And most of our times, in my opinion, hidden uh, under the misuse term of uh, curation. And I would love to know what are your thoughts on, on these and what do you think it's going to happen now that more and more institutions from the traditional art world like museums and auction house, houses and private galleries are actually penetrating the, the crypto art space and we're expecting them to be even more present in the future. Yeah, I would separate crypto art from NFTs there. So when a big gallery comes in um, and takes 50% commission and brings with them all these vetted artists that they're already showing or are only shows artists that are like super successful, um, that's not crypto art. Nothing about that is crypto art, right? Like that's NFTs, like if they're selling NFTs, but that has nothing to do with crypto art. And now I will, I'll be the first to acknowledge that crypto art is an ideal now. It's like a spectrum. Um, so, you know, uh, Rarible or OpenSea still let lots of people, uh, anyone who wants to can mint on OpenSea. So that they get a checkbox there in terms of, you know, uh, skewing towards being decentralized, right? But in the early days, it absolutely everything was decentralized. I mean, they were taking zero commissions and every artist was welcome in, right? So I see it as not quite that crypto art is dead, but it's heyday has already happened. Like the high point of crypto art is when you have, um, you know, the curio cards and you have rare Pepe wallet and you have CryptoPunks and you have Dada NYC. Like 
That, by my definition of crypto art, which is everyone gets to participate, which makes sense because it's borrowing these decentralized ideals that come from, you know, the newsflash cryptocurrency, right? Like, that was the whole point back then. Like, that was the pinnacle time when, you know, we had a, a, an altruistic movement where there wasn't a whole bunch of money coming in, but we were trying to build a new, you know, art world and support each other and experiment. We, we weren't even sure if these new rules could work and scale where, like, you know, you could build a system where the system system makes no money and the artist makes all the money or how these things look. So yeah, to, to answer your question, when um, when a super f well-known gallery brings in a super well-known artist, takes a massive commission <laughs> um, and sells it as an NFT, that has nothing to do with crypto art. Those are sort of two different things. Um, a, B, C, D. Sorry, it looks like a question from someone whose name is listed as A, B, C, D. Yeah, A, B, C, D, D. Hi, um, my name is Natasha. I'm a visual artist from Uganda. Um, well, my question, right now the question I have, I have two questions. One, as a collector, do you really look for utility from artists? And my other question would be, what would you advise an artist to incorporate other, me other medium to create, or new mediums of creating, as compared to what they've been creating? For example, if I'm a digital artist and I've been creating illustrations, and would you advise me to get into another medium, like maybe dance, under the same, under the same artist name, or, or with that so um, it was a little bit difficult to hear, so I'm going to try to play it back, and maybe you could help me. I think the first question was, uh, as a collector, do I look for utility in art? Was that what that word was? Yes, that's what I said. Can you hear me now? Oh, much, much better. Yeah, yeah. So we'll do them one by one. You know, as a collector, do I look for utility in artwork? No. Uh, so for me, art inherently has utility. Um, I've been, my entire life um, has been about being passionate about, um, you know, art and art history and making art. And so the utility for me is my entire quality of life is driven and dictated by the amazing art that I've accessed on a regular basis throughout my life, right? Like when I'm depressed or feeling confused or uncertain, I go to a museum and that's like my therapy session I come out and like you know that's it, it like I feel a thousand times better and like you know art helps me understand how to understand the world around me it's like gives me a different lens to understand the world around me so when when people talk about utility in the nft space they often think like oh this buy this nft and it'll give you access for free tickets to this or like it'll um make it so you can get my next nft cheaper or whatever like I may be a little bit different from this new breed of collectors, but there's plenty of utility in art just being art uh, for me, A. And B, I actually get really frustrated by gamification. Um, I don't want to have to do so, like, buy some special pass and stand on my head and recite, like, a, a magic phrase and then compete with five other collectors in order to get the art. If I love the art, I just want to buy the art and maybe have a conversation with the, the uh, artist so that I can get to know them better, right? Like, art's... Art stands on its own more than enough that I somehow have to do some weird competition or magical gamification. I think I understand why marketplaces are doing that because this market goes up and down and when fewer people are buying, they're really struggling to sell and they want to help the artist sell and they need to sell themselves. But as a collector, it's a massive turnoff um, to me. I, I just... To, it distracts from the art, and the art's what matters. So sorry, I, I know you had a second half to your question, too. Sorry, was did you want to share the, the second part to the question? I think it might have had to do with, like, um, materials or media. I heard something about illustration. Uh, might have lost you. We'll go to Connie Bakshi, and then we can come back to ABCD um, after. Sorry, my mic was muted. My bad. Oh, there we go. Um, okay. Yes. So my question was, would you advise an artist to get into a different medium 
For example, if I entered the NFT space as a digital illustrator, but now with time, I've found myself loving dance and poetry, and I'd love to express myself as an artist through NFTs in these other different mediums. But the challenge is, is that acceptable or do I have to stick to this medium just to stay consistent for my collectors? Yeah, so I'm, you know, my answers are always going to be pro art over pro commerce, right? So uh, I think you should explore as an artist, whatever is interesting to you. And I think what made NFT space in the first place was experimentation. And we lose that sometimes people feel like, oh, like now it's like hard and fast, like you go to the marketplace and you do this that, and the other, but you have to remember, like, all of those things came out of experiments and it's too early for us to, to stop on the experimentation. You know, one of the first vertical crypto uh, residencies, um, you know, folks were talking about like, I want to do poetry NFTs. And I'm like, I don't even know how, how that would work. Right. Uh, but, but verse is out there now. And like, there's all kinds of poets doing NFTs. And like, so like I had a very similar question, you know, um, throughout various residencies of people that are like, I'm into X and can I do that with NFTs? And I'm like, sure you can. Like, I don't know how. And like, you know, if the if the question is like, will my collectors be turned off or will my collectors buy it? I mean, no one really knows that. But I think the moment you start making your art to please your collectors, some part of your soul kind of dies. And I know like we all have to make money um, and I don't want to sound like I'm detached from the reality of like we all have to make some money and survive. But like I really do think when once you start getting to a point where you're trying to do a trade off, like if you really excited about something creatively that you want to do and you're like but maybe people won't buy it i say do it anyway right um i mean that's that should be what drives you thank you uh, for that yeah of course it was a great question let's go to connie bakshi hey jason um so i i think connie? what if can you hear me all right sure can oh. i was just saying hi, hi connie Oh, sorry about that. Okay, yeah, hi. <laughs> um, so I, I think one of my big takeaways from your presentation is it, it, it kind of carries over from your your last um, your last response, but that the crypto movement is really about experimenting um, with breaking the rules of these cultural, social, and even economic behaviors and norms, right? Um, but I, I think you know I would actually say there's arguably still this. This market self-organization that's taken place in this post people, post NFT hype um, era. So, really, I'd love to get your take on where are the spaces that you think there are still room for experimentation. Yeah, I think experimentation, um, in by my definition, isn't about joining uh, or following. It's about leading, right? So, I think there's. The way my mindset works, you know, when I came into this space early on and no one really cared about it was like, oh, here's a space where the tracks haven't been laid and, and I'm just going to throw tracks down. Or, you know, I'm going to start writing about this and then saying what I said. So it was like, I, I think like, here, so let me let me back up a little bit. Crypto art and NFTs aren't monolithic. There are a bunch of different subgroups, right, and subcultures. And I think you can find subcultures that are more open to experimentation or less open to experimentation, right? Um, but even these, let's call them more liberal and open, you know, um, subcultures are going to have their own set of rules. Like all, all communities have their own set of rules and guidelines or whatever, right? And if you want to get really experimental, like for those folks, I say like, don't join a community, like start your own community, just start making stuff. If you want to make something that's not out there or doesn't fit under the umbrella of the uh, one of the existing sub communities within uh, the larger group, I think be that bold person to do the thing that, you know, that isn't out there yet, rather than looking for permission or, or, or a community that will accept it. And I think people will follow, you know, follow you and, and you'll be able to grow from there. Now that may sound kind of naive, but you have to remember I've lived through this now, right? So like I joined this community when it was like a couple dozen people and it's now like the entire, it went from like, we're doing something really nerdy that no one's ever going to care about to like the entire world for a while in 2021 could not stop talking about NFTs. Right. And that's an example of a few nerdy people doing something that wasn't particularly popular. That was very experimental. So I guess I'm blabbing a bit, but what I'm trying to do is detach 
the need to find a community with the, the, the privilege to do something experimental because I think you can just strike out and do something and people will be drawn to that and respect you and you can kind of start a group in that direction. But I also want to make sure I didn't go too far astray from, from what you were actually looking for in terms of an answer. Is that, is that helpful, Connie? Absolutely. And, you know, it's all, I'm also thinking, you know, just even ontologically, what are, I think it's more about what are the questions that crypto art is now asking? Mm, that's a great question. I would say um, they're asking the same questions, but with uh, uh, a little bit more perspective and, and um, you know, uh, have been around a bit longer. For me, the questions that crypto art, maybe not NFTs, but the crypto art are asking is, can art be relevant and collectible and sustaining across way more people, right? Art, the art world, the traditional art world, the one that gets written about, you know, or historically was written about, always felt like it was a very small number of artists that could make a living. And I think that plays out. I went to art school twice in, in my life and have hundreds of friends that are artists. None of them get to make art full time, right, before NFTs come around. And now I know some that can because of NFTs. But like, so the question is like, can we build a new art? world where lots and lots and lots and lots of artists can can at least get some sort of compensation that allows them to continue to be able to create and a new art world where lots and lots and lots and lots of people feel like it's you know uh, fun to be able to participate and collect in a way that doesn't break the bank and doesn't require that they be millionaires right and I think that that was core to a lot of what the early questions were and it's not an answered question yet I don't think right um, I think we, st we still need to know I certainly see lots of lots of artists trying to make NFTs but I see lots of them complaining that they haven't sold a single one you know or I see lots of collectors that are potentially interested but they're like well this is confusing and I don't know how to onboard and what's a metamask or you know how do I do this but I think I think that might be the core question still I love that thank you Jason yeah, great question. Thank you. Uh, Martha. Let's see. Thank you for the presentation. I'm walking to a meeting. Okay, no, no worries. Um, Aaron, did I get that right? Aaron? Hey, hello, Irina. 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 Oh, I, th I thought the last name was Angels, maybe. Irina. Nice to meet you. No, Irina. Angels. Angels. Because my dance style is geometrical style. That's why like, uh, I'm Irina Angels. <laughs> so, yeah, ah. my name is Irina. And I'm uh, a dancer and multidisciplinary artist from Ukraine. And uh, thank you so much for your presentation. And in some moments, I was so emotional because uh, you your words were so inspirative and um, like it's really like breakthrough for all art worldwide, in my opinion. And thank you for giving these uh, options about years and uh, evolution of NFT. So as a member of uh, Dance Performance NFT community, I'm so curious to know your opinion. Um, NFT used to be a space for digital artists, like back in the years, right? And um, how do you see the future of um, NFT uh, for other forms, for other art forms? Yeah, we know like his story about uh, NFT photography and it's like super popular now and it, it took uh, its own place in NFT space. Uh, yeah, I, I'm curious to know your opinion and vision on other art forms. Thank you so much. Yeah, no, thank you for the, the kind words. Um, and yeah, it's been interesting. You know, one of the first articles I wrote in early, early 2018 was about photography. And we were, again, we weren't calling them NFTs yet. So we were, it was, you know, photography and blockchain. It seemed like such a natural marriage, you know, um, that with digital photography, images are made natively digital and everyone has a camera on their phone. And I thought, well, this will be the thing that takes off first. And it actually took a long time for photography to become, it was like one random summer after like, you know, uh, NFTs had taken off, like a few big collectors started collecting it and then it started to take off. So it surprises me um, how some things take a while. And I think I already mentioned earlier, like poetry, I was like, huh, I don't know if that'll be a thing or not, you know, um, and it's starting to take off, right? So I don't know that I can predict what comes next, but I won't be surprised if anything, um, whether it's, you know, 
fashion or movies, you know, seem like they, sh you know, would be a thing that come in, um, or, you know, just about anything I think could become, um, you know, digital or it's, it's digital equivalent via the metaverse or something like that could become a digital collectible or a digital artwork. So I guess maybe rather than give you an answer about a specific genre that's going to become big or what the future of that looks like, I'll talk a little bit about what I personally hope to see. A lot of our definitions, like photography and music and illustration or generative art or, you know, a lot of these things come sort of from an analog world, like a non-digital world, right? And they made sense in the non-digital world. But I'd love to see more of computing is actually pretty amazing at blending and blurring the lines between sound art, music art, performance art, generative art, visual art, interaction, gaming, poetry, all these things, right? Um, those guidelines between, you know, one thing being this or that, like, could kind of go away and we can use programming and computers to give experiences that are wholly new and have new classifications and kind of blend all these media together. So I'm a little disappointed some days that like I'll go to collect NFTs and everything looks like it's like a, a based on a 1950s like abstract expressionist canvas painting or whatever and I'm like come on we're like 60 years later 70 years later and like people are making things like you know from their computer give me some interaction like interactivity like code this thing or like combine your music with your visual like you know stop trying to pull physical world art into the digital environment and really tap into what these di new digital tools can do. I feel like we were further ahead in like 2007, early like processing programming days, like 2007 to 2010, people were making super cool like interactive data viz art stuff that just bled between like all these different categories. And I'm not seeing that in NFTs, I'm seeing a lot of static images. So yeah, hopefully we see sort of uh, more multimedia ex exploratory digital stuff uh, become the, the direction that things go and the barriers between them won't matter so much. I think we've got one more from ABCD. Question. And I might have to make this the last one. I think I might have already missed. Um, I'm super glad to, to answer these questions, but I might have missed my, uh, my company meeting, which is okay. I like you guys better. Anyway, don't tell anyone, Danielle, if you're still listening. Uh, let's see. Uh, Caesar is running. Yep. So, and I, I don't know that we're getting one from ABCD. So, uh, Oria, uh, I think I might have to wind down. I want to thank you if you're still here. Thank you for inviting yes. me. Um, and folks that have questions that maybe didn't get a chance to ask them, um, you can ask uh, at ArtGnome on uh, Twitter. So I'm on Twitter all the time, um, and I'm more than happy. This is my favorite topic. I'm more than happy to talk about anything. I love the artists that come into the art residency. Hopefully what came across in my presentation is that um, a big part of this is that this is a new, more inclusive global art world. And that's fun to say, but it doesn't happen on its own. It takes people like me, Cole, who invented you know this digital, free digital um, artist residency, and she proactively goes and, and you know, um, get submissions from artists all around the world. And without that, it's very easy to see this sort of skew towards one section of the world or the other. So when I talk about thinking about what you can do to help build, um, you know, the crypto art world, um, you know, part of that is finding ways to recruit other artists from other parts of the world that maybe don't know about this space and helping to onboard them to make sure that we keep it really diverse and friendly and open. Um, and if you see other people that have questions, just like I'm paying it forward and taking time out of my day to answer any questions you guys might have and to share my experience, please do uh, realize, you know, maybe even if you're just new to this space, you can do the same thing. You know, we owe it, um, you know, so many people brought me into this space and were patient with me. And that's why I do this, you know, uh, today with all of you. And please be that person um, and help other people along that, that have questions as you come across them. And with that, I'm going to say uh, goodbye. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Thanks, Jason.